So uh, when we say modular uh, arithmetic, what we mean is the remainders when we divide a number by another number. So how do you divide a number by another number? What is the general rule for that? There's a special thing, a special rule, procedure. What do we call that procedure of dividing a number by another number? Long division, yes. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, so some of you guys, uh, yes. I, what I was trying to, yes. I'm thinking about division algorithm, which is a super cool idea, division algorithm. No one likes the long uh, division, right? So long division is annoying. I mean, it was good, it was cool when you were fourth grade or third grade, but after a while you realize it's such a pain. Uh, in ultimately what we need is, if you are dividing, say, a number A by another number B, what you really have is uh, you have a quotient K and then a remainder R. Do you guys remember that? So this is division algorithm uh, in a sense is to check that your division, long division is correct. Yeah. So A is equal to B times K plus R where this is the quotient and this is the divisor. So you are dividing A by B. Uh, and this is the important thing, the remainder. Uh, right now, there's, this is not totally correct. What I did right, I forgot to mention something here. What is it? That's not really the division algorithm. I, uh, there's a very, for instance, let me tell you, if I were to divide 17 by five, I would say that, there you go. I divided 17 by five, and I think the quotient is two, and the remainder is seven. Is that correct? If you guys want, I can do it. 17 divided by five, uh, two times, 10, seven left. There you go. I, I'm totally cool with my division. <laughs> yes, okay, like you guys suggested. So there's a restriction about the remainder. The remainder has to be between zero and, uh, and the divisor, in this case, B, right? So uh, you, your remainder cannot be uh, more than or equal to five. So the correct way of doing it is exactly 17 is actually equal to three times five plus two. So if you were to divide 17 by five, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the divisor, uh, uh, sorry, we are dividing by five, yes. So the, the quotient would have been three and the remainder would have been two. Huh? So that's, that's pretty good. So this, this, don't ignore this, right? So this is an important condition when we do the division algorithm. So for instance, suppose that we have A, that first number, and then we have another number C. When you divide by B again, uh, the quotient is L and the remainder is S. Now let's see if we can find out some cool rules that we can implement. For instance, I would wonder what would be the remainder if I were to divide A plus C by B again. So it would have a certain quotient, but what would have been the remainder if I were to divide A plus C by B? Yes, uh, for those of you who, are, who just recently joined, uh, the, the chat room is now private, so it's, we can focus much better this way. Yes, I think everyone would have agreed with that, right? So let's quickly check. All I do is I just plug in A and B, uh, A and C into the uh, A, B times K plus R. So this is A plus uh, C is B times L plus S. I can reorganize this thing. I can factor out the B, K plus L plus R plus S. Aha. Um, so here, obviously, this is divisible by B, divisible by B, and, um, and, and, and as a result, this would be kind of the remainder, right? With a concern, uh, we, we don't know if R plus S is greater than B or not, right? So it might be greater than B, yes. Assuming that R plus S is less than B, that's, that would be correct. So if there's any B here, uh, we need to take it out and then put it onto the other side. But other than that, hmm, that's uh, interesting. If we do the same thing for A times C, A times C, uh, pretty much plugging in the same thing, B K plus R, B L plus S. Interestingly, huh? 
it, it would be just the product of RNS. The remainder would be the product of RNS, right? So let's just distribute. So we would get B squared KL plus BKS plus BLR plus RS. And sure enough, the first term is definitely divisible by B. This has a B in it. This has a B in it. This has a B in it. So therefore, if I were to divide A times C by B, the remainder would have been R times S. And if it is greater than B, we would have to subtract some Bs from it. Yes. So therefore, this kind of brings us a new arithmetic of doing stuff. So we call it the modular arithmetic. So this is a new type of arithmetic, which is uh, obviously it has a lot of other features that I need to be careful about. But the, the, the main idea is there so that uh, we can add numbers and multiply numbers and the, 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 the remainders would, would, would accordingly um, be the same. So from now on, something like this. I, where R is less than B or not, actually, it doesn't matter if this holds then I would say that A has a remainder of R upon division by B. Aha. So whenever I divide A, that's the notation. I know it's kind of ugly at the beginning. It takes time to get used to it. So this is a new sign, congruent sign. It's not an equal sign. It's a congruent sign. So A is congruent to R mod B. All right. Or A is equivalent to R mod B. All right, yeah, if you have any questions, please, uh, yeah, write it on the chat box. I'll be happy to answer the questions. All right, so um, R doesn't have to be less than, yes, R doesn't have to be less than B. It can be, but ultimately what we really care is uh, to reduce it as much as possible. So for instance, 17 is congruent to, uh, 17 is congruent to 12 mod 5. If you in, in analyze it in mod 5, 17 upon division by 5 has a remainder 2. 12 also has a remainder of 2 upon division by 5. Hey, 7 also has a remainder upon division by 5, a remainder of 2 upon division by 5. But really, the smallest positive one is a 2. 2 uh, uh, is the smallest one. In fact, what we usually call it is, I know it's a little bit technical word, so zero, one, whenever you divide a number by five, these would be the, the remainders, right? Uh, the, uh, the, we, 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 we call this the residue, yes, residue class. This is called a complete residue class, yes. So complete residue class okay so good um so zero one two three four it is customary to reduce 17 all the way to two right so what we are saying is 17 upon division by five has a remainder two as is 12 and seven so all of these are the same number module of five but yeah it's 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 yeah okay Yes, you can use Euclidean algorithm uh, to find it. That's correct. So that's very good. Okay, so, and similarly, 17 is also congruent to 22 mod 5. That's correct. You can go upwards as well. All right, so these type of ideas will be extremely useful in just a few minutes. But because of these two rules that we analyzed, we, so we can add modulo uh, any number and we can multiply and that's that works so addition and multiplication works you might wonder how about division and really dividing it by a number we can reinterpret it in the following way for instance if i want to divide five by three modulo let's say modulo i don't know uh, seven what do we mean what is the meaning of this so addition and multiplication makes sense but how about division what does that mean no meaning. <laughs> I, 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 I need one keyword. Okay, so I think a couple of you already figured it. Yes, 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 yes. So dividing five by three is the same thing as uh, five times one third. When we say times one third, what we really mean is five times the inverse of three the inverse of a number so so that's that's actually the spirit of the actual division that you are so much used to doing in 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 the in the in the arithmetic but but this is 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 a much better uh 
formulation, right? So all we need is how do I find the inverse of a number? So for instance, what is the inverse of three modulo seven? Three multiplied with which number will give you a one? Um, yes, that would be a five, right? So indeed, if you were to multiply three and five elsewhere, so that would have been 15, well, equal sign, I guess. And indeed, 15 is congruent to one modulo seven. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so that's pretty good. So therefore, I can continue this calculation as five times. The inverse of three is, we, we just established, is also a five. So that's just 25. And 25 modulo seven is, is four. Yes. Wow, so that's awkward. <laughs> <laughs> so 5 over 3 <laughs> modulo 7, uh, so 5 over 3 is, is just 4. That's strange. So because modulo 7, the, the complete residue class is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, the answer could be that. Um, let's, let's, uh, does every number has an inverse? Uh, huh? Uh, let, let's check if that's, yeah, so it's it's not clear if every number would have an inverse, so maybe this operation will not be valid all the time, right? Uh, yes, okay, so modulo 6, for instance, that thing wouldn't have been workable. So, for instance, let's check. What is the inverse? Let me ask you a couple of inverses. What is the inverse of, say, 3 modulo 4? Yes, okay, I think everybody agrees. Three times three would have done the trick, right? So three times three is equal to nine, which is congruent to one modulo four. If you were to divide nine by four, the, res the remainder would have been one, suggesting that three is, is its own inverse. All right, that's reasonable. So how about the inverse of three mod five? Mod five. Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So three times two is six, which is congruent to one again, mod five. Aha, so therefore the inverse of three is three mod four, but it is two mod five, right? So yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so under what circumstances? So how about the inverse of three mod six? Yeah, we, we won't be able to find any such thing, right? So we can quickly check everything. So all you need to check is the, the complete residue class. So you can, well, we don't have to check zero. That's just a zero all the time. So that's, so three times one is just congruent to three. Three times two is congruent to zero again. Three times three, nine is congruent to three. Three times four is 12 congruent to zero again. Three times five is... 15, which is congruent to two. And that's, uh, that's pretty much it. So we multiplied three with all the potential residues. So we multiplied it with zero, one, two, three, four, five. None of them gave me a one. So as a result, three doesn't have an inverse modulo six. So a number will have an inverse modulo any number under what circumstance? So let's write it as a theorem or something if you want inverse of A modulo modulo M exists if what? Yes, <laughs> if they are relative, oh well, okay, let me continue here. If A and M, their greatest common divisor, oops. Yeah, A, oops, the greatest common divisor of A and M is one. Usually mathematicians are very lazy people, so they would just write it as a comma m is one. So it's the same thing, yes. So you don't have to write greatest common divisor. Usually we would write it for LCM, least common multiple, but greatest common divisor is much more, yeah, useful than that. Three times five is three. Okay, I messed up probably. Three times five is three, not two. Sorry for that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so now we, we have, the, and obviously, and, uh, and uh, well, whatever, and there exists, uh, so A times B is equal to one. So that B here would be modulo M. That B is the inverse of A. A inverse is 
is, is just B model. Okay, good. Uh, so you can, for instance, multiply both sides. Oh, let's do it in two steps. Multiply both sides of this by A to the power minus one. Uh, one times A to the power minus one is just A to the power minus one. So these two, they, they, they because it's A's inverse, if it exists, uh, so B is congruent to A to the minus one. So that B is the inverse of A. All right, so pretty good. Uh, let me see. All right, so let's do a little bit of, uh, before we go into uh, exponents, uh, a couple of other ideas. Uh, so just to practice stuff, right? So if I were to ask you, um, okay, I, I have the following claim. I, I will have back-to-back -back claims, okay? So let me change my pencil colors. Okay, so my claim is that n square is congruent. Okay, let, let me not write it as a claim. But if I say, what is n square modulo 3? For any n, what would you say? So people say it's either zero or one. How do you prove such a thing? How do you know n square is congruent to either? So whenever you, you square a number, a perfect a square is has a remainder of either zero or one mod three. If when you divide by three, yes, all you need is just to check all the complete residue class. So the complete residue class for uh, for three is just zero, one, and two. All I need is just check those three cases. So obviously zero square is congruent to zero mod three, one square is congruent to one mod three, and two square, which is four, is congruent to one mod three as well. Aha! So that's pretty good. So whenever you have a square, um, so that's either a zero or a one. Um, yeah. So that, that, that's, uh, that's very neat. And you, you can imagine a lot of applications as well. Okay, so here's another claim or another thing that I will ask you, how about n square modulo five? Is congruent to what modulo five? Oh gosh, that's a five. Yeah, all you need is quickly test uh, zero square, one square, two square, three square, and uh, four square. That's, that's pretty much it. All right, so, and like you guys said, it is zero, one, or four, right? So zero square is a zero, so zero is definitely there. One square is a one, so one definitely there. Two square is a four. Three square is a nine, which is also a four. Four square is 16. 16 is, is a one. That's pretty much it, so zero, one, and four. Sometimes we would write it as zero, one, and minus one. Zero and plus minus one, because four, is congruent to minus one. So these are all minus one mod five, right? And usually you will find it, it is extremely convenient sometimes for larger numbers to write it in negative, which is, which is nice. Okay, um, that's right. So three square is just minus two square and minus two square as a result is also four. Yeah, that's right. Okay, good. How about, okay, let, let, let me not write it as a, or let's just quickly say it, claim. And uh, n square in mod eight. What is it? Mod eight. So the residue class is slightly bigger now. Zero square, one square. You need to test a lot of things, but because a lot of you guys are preparing for the math counts, maybe so it might be a good idea to practice this as much as you can, right? So it will give you a lot of advantage in terms of. Huh? Yes. <laughs> Uh, wow. Okay, so zero square is a zero, definitely in this list. One square is a one, definitely in this list. Zero and one will always be there, right? So zero and one, zero and one, zero and one will always be there. So it's kind of useless to do this too, basically. Two square is a four, so four will be in that list. Uh, three square is a nine, that's a one. Four square is 16, which is, what, what is it? That's a zero. Five square, Oh, wow, because four and eight are not relatively prime. No wonder we got a zero there. Uh, they're multiples. Uh, so five squared is 25, that's a one. Six squared is 36, a four. And then seven squared, 49, that's a one. You guys see that's only zero, one, or four. Yep, those are, these are all kind of math count skills. All right, let's do a couple more. Let's try the cubes. Cubes might be fun. Uh, by the way, you can try this for a lot of different uh, modulo 
modulos, right? So that, that would be useful. For instance, what is n cubed modulo nine? If I were to divide a cube by nine, what would be the remainders? So because mod nine, so you need to test all these zero cube, one cubed, two cubed, three cubed, four cubed, five cubed, this is annoying, six cubed, seven cubed, eight cubed. That's it, that's the complete residue class. Um, yes, so this is a zero and a one, two cubed is an eight, so zero, one, eight so far. Eight is minus one, that's correct. Uh, three cubed is a 27, which is what? Uh, that's a zero, I guess, right? So four cubed, 64. 64 is 63, that's a one. Uh, 125. So at this step, I think you guys agree that I can replace five with minus four. So this would be minus four cubed. So it would be a minus one. So that would have been an eight. Do you guys agree? So five and minus four are congruent to each other modulo nine. So I might as well just write it as a minus four cubed, which is the same thing as minus four cubed and previously I just calculated it's a one so minus one so yeah uh, which is just uh, which is just an eight all right so this whole thing is for five cubed and I can pretty much do the same thing for six cubed is just minus uh, minus three cubed which is minus of three cubed was a zero so minus zero that's just a zero and then this one is minus two cubed My, uh, two cubed was an eight so this is minus eight which is just uh, just a one I guess and finally eight cubed this is just minus one cubed which is just a minus one which is just an eight so basically just zero one or eight that's that's pretty much it yeah yeah in a lot of contests you will see that you you will have a significant advantage if you guys know these things right so for instance if i told you that what is the solutions to this congruence a cubed plus b cubed is equal to, is congruent to three. Find all the A's and the B's that would solve this modulo nine. What is the A and the B that would solve it? A cubed plus B cubed. Yes, there are no such solutions to this equation, right? Or to this congruence. Do you see why? Because A, A cubed is either zero, one or eight. B cubed is either zero, one or eight. There's no way that you add any combination of these to get ever at three, right? So the best you can do is you can, both of them can be one. One plus one is the closest you can get. You can, you can get to a two, but never you can get to a three. You cannot get to a four and so on. So it is kind of, hmm, that, that's interesting, right? So we can, uh, yeah, so that, that will give us some advantage. And there's quite a few contest problems which makes use of this, by the way. All right, so uh, I think everybody is, uh, is happy so far. Let's have a look at something slightly different. Uh, okay, so I'll just do this one once. Or actually, let's start with this. There are these KD tables. So for instance, modulo five, uh, I can put all the residues, zero, one, two, three, four, and I can try addition, let's say, or multiple, well, actual addition is, it's not that useful so let's do multiplication because ultimately our goal is to understand exponentiation so let's try a multiplication zero one two three four uh, we can easily fill up that table so this is the standard arithmetic table you guys used to do when you were like second grade or first grade i don't know so zero times anything is basically zero so this column is all zeros this row is all zeros multiplying by one is easy so that's one two three four that's one, two, three, four. Now we can also multiply by two. Uh, and we are doing it by in mod five. So two times two is a four. Two times three is a one. Two times four is a three, I think. Three times two is a one. Three times three, nine, that's a four. Three times four, 12, that's a two. Uh, four times two, eight, that's a three. Four times three, 12, that's a two. Four times four, 16, that's a one. Okay, so that's a standard multiplication table. Anything of interest here? For instance, usually I love checking the, 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 the ones. Why do I sometimes wonder where the ones are? This is definitely symmetric. Yes, the ones are useful because they tell me the inverses of each other. For instance, earlier we discussed that the inverse of three mod five is two, and it's clear here who is whose inverse, right? So for instance, four is its own inverse, right? Because look at that. 
So four is its own inverse. The inverse of three is two and the inverse of two is a three. The inverse of one is a one. So that's a pretty good deal. Each column and each row, ignoring this first, from now on, whenever you do multiplication, we will never put the zero column, right? But when you focus on this thing, yes, it is pretty simple. We use all the numbers once. That's interesting. Uh, well, yes, on this sub uh, graph. So that's, that's uh, interesting. So let's do, uh, in a similar way, um, uh, well, okay, let, let me just mention it to you. Five was a prime. And because one, two, three, and four are relatively prime to five, that's why such a thing happened. It will not happen again if I were to check mod six, for instance. Interestingly, that kind of brings me to the following concept. Okay, I'll go a little bit faster. So check, for instance, let's check, say, modulo, um, uh, modulo say, eight. All right, so modulo eight. I can construct a table like this quickly. Uh, and then let's discuss what is the implication. Okay, let, let me actually con construct the table right here quickly. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, we are doing it modulo eight, and this is a multiplication table, okay? So obviously the first two rows, it's very straightforward. I mean, the first row and the first column, I should say. Uh, four, five, six, seven. Now multiplying by two, again, we are doing it modulo eight. All right, so the, the second row would be what? Two times two, oops, sorry for that. Two times two is a four, two times three, six, two times four, eight, zero, two times five, uh, 10, two, two times six, 12, four, two times seven, 14. What's that? That's a six. Thank you. How about the third row? Three times two, that's a six. Three times three, that's a one. Three times four, what's it? Three times four? 12, that's a four. Oh, wow. Okay, thank you. Some of you guys already did it. 15, that's a six. Seven, seven, I think. Three times five, uh, 15, that's a seven. Three times six, 18, that's a two. Three times seven. And let me know if I make a, mis a mistake here. 21, that's a five. All right. Yes. Okay. Next row is four, zero, four, zero, four, zero. Seriously? Oh, I love that. Thank you. Okay, there you go. How about the next row? Five times. Five times two is 10. That's a two. Five times three, 15. That's a seven. Five times, hey, it is symmetric, right? It's supposed to be. So uh, anything beyond the, the main diagonal better be symmetrical, right? I, I might as well just complete that part quickly then. Okay, hold on. Four and a six here. So it is symmetric with respect to this diagonal, something that I should have seen it before. Okay, so uh, this diagonal, four, seven, two, five. And then you, as you said, this is a four, a zero, a four. Okay, five times five is 25, that's a one. Five times six is 30, so that's a six, a six here. Five times seven is 35, oh gosh, bear with me. <laughs> six times six, 36, that's a four. Uh, six times seven, 42, that is a two. And finally, seven times seven, 49, that's a one. Okay, did I mess up so far? All right, so, so far, so good. All right, you guys can see that some of the elements has inverses, some of them don't have inverses, right? So three has an inverse, well, obviously one has its inverse, five has an inverse, and seven has an inverse. Do you guys see that? No good job. <laughs> well, we, I think we were totally lucky to have all these inverses on the main diagonal. So which elements have inverses? One, three, five and seven. What is special about one, three, five and seven? They are odd, yes. But more importantly, they are relatively prime to eight. You know what? Instead of doing a multiplication table on this complete residue class, why don't we do a multiplication table on what? A new multiplication table on, instead of the complete residue class, we can do it on the reduced Residue class. What the? What's a reduced residue class? So all I do is I check all the numbers which are relatively prime to eight, which you guys told me are one, three, five, and seven. So this is a subset of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, sorry, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which is the complete residue class. We call this a reduced residue class. Reduced. And it is reduced because uh, it's all of the numbers which are relatively prime to eight. And let's see if something interesting comes out of it. So uh, again, we do check it in mod eight. Okay, so multiplication in mod eight. 
Uh, so one, three, five, seven. One, three, five, seven. All right, let's do it again. One, three, five, seven. One, three, five, seven. Well, actually, we did it here, right? All I do is I just pull the numbers uh, from this table, right? So these numbers, so which is huh? this, that, 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 and then this, that, that, that. So it should be very straightforward, right? So, so we next one is three one seven five three one seven five. So next one is five seven one three five seven one three, and then seven five three one. So what's interesting here? A latent square. <laughs> okay, what just happened? Whenever we multiply two elements from this residue uh, reduced residue class. What happens? Yes, this is closed. Yeah, this is a closed group actually. <laughs> so the, these guys, they are so much in love with each other. So whenever you multiply them amongst themselves, it gives you elements from that thing. Let's see if this is coincidence. What do you call it, coincidence? No, in my classrooms, I never call it coincidence. What do I call it? <laughs> this is an old line from a movie, The Matrix. Yes, I call it providence. <laughs> I once said this in my class, that I never call something coincidence, I call it providence. And then one of my students said, what is the difference? <laughs> and, and yeah, that was fun. All right. So in my classes, I never call it coincidence, providence. This is from the movie, The Matrix. I don't know if you watched the movie, The Matrix. Uh, it is an old movie, my generation, we love that movie. Uh, especially if you have an interest in computer science. Um, so it might be an interesting movie to watch. Okay, let's see if this was really providence or it's just uh, nothing. Um, so let's do a couple other examples. So let's do it in mod 10. Oops. So multiplication table of the reduced residue class Modulo 10. So what is the reduced residue class modulo 10? What are the numbers which are relatively prime to 10? Yes, one, three. Yes, three is relative. Four is not relatively prime to 10. Four and 10 has a common, they share a two. So we want to list all of them that seven. Yes, five is not because five and 10, they share a five. And last one is... Last one is nine, that's it. Why don't we just construct a multiplication table? Oh, sorry, not five, we said, right? There you go, one, three, seven, nine. Let's see what happens. If, if that magical thing happens again, then we, we, we found something very interesting indeed. From there, we can take it to the next level. All right, so one, three, seven, nine. Okay, so I'm lazy, I did the first. <laughs> okay, can you give me the numbers on the second row? So we are doing it mod 10. Mod 10, uh, yeah, so we already tested mod 8 work, so we wondered if that was just a coincidence or if it is providence. <laughs> yes, 3917, that's correct, 3917. So how about the next row? Seven, so seven times three twenty one. That's a one nine and three. Yeah, seven times seven is forty nine. So the, it has a remainder of nine. So it's pretty good. Mod ten is is lovely, right? And lastly, nine nine times three. That's a seven. Nine times seven sixty three. That's a three. Nine times nine eighty one. That's a one. Hey, the same thing happened. The ones you can see they all appeared. The threes in each row we have a unique three. That's perfect. So basically, when you multiply numbers inside that uh, reduced, reduced residue, residues, you get back a reduced residue, which is pretty cool. And uh, the, the, that tells you that there's something really deep going on here, right? One, three, seven, nine. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it. All right, so you guys can uh, do the rest. And that's why, by the way, so we did test it for 10, it works. We tested it for eight, it works. 
we tested it even for five, right? Because we mentioned that one, two, three, four, they were all relatively prime. So the complete residue class and the residu uh, reduced residue class, well, not exactly. So, the, so this is the re reduced residue class, right? So when you multiply, you get the same, same thing, which is really, really nice. All right, so now uh, we, are, uh, we, we are ready to, to, to start working with powers. So how do we do powers in modular arithmetic? How do you take, raise a number to another number? Anyone remembers? Yeah, multiply it many times. There you go. <laughs> ah, okay, so some of us have seen it before. Yes. Uh, there's a couple of ways. Some people, they use binomial theorem, which is lovely, obviously, an algebraic method, which works. But yet a better one, uh, method would be, yes, something called Fermat's little theorem. And then the generalization of it, which is Euler's theorem, right? So why do we call it Fermat's little theorem? <laughs> yeah, it's little, yes. Is there a bigger theorem somewhere, right? Yeah, that, that was a bigger one. They called it Fermat's last theorem. It was proven during the 1990s. Uh, you all know that a square, well, okay, forget the square. a to the n plus b to the n is equal to c to the n doesn't have any solutions. Is that, is that Fermat's last theorem or last theorem? No solutions. Ah, for n greater than two, right? For n equals two, we have a lot of them. We know the Pythagorean triples. Yes, if n is greater than two, there is no such solutions to this. And this was a big thing for how many years? Like four centuries, people tried to prove this result because it, it was so, so, it looked so simple and yet, yeah. So if you wanna add two cubes, you, you will never get any, another cube. Or if you add two fourth powers, you will never get a fourth power and so on. You will, you can have things like that, right? A, um, I don't know, a to the four plus b to the four equals c squared. You can find ABC integers ABC like this, uh, but yeah, so for the fourth power, yeah, that's not gonna work. All right, so, oh, oh and then ABC, okay, so ABC, are integers, non-zero integers, are positive. Otherwise, yes, then you would have zero to the n plus b to the n is equal to b to the n. Yeah, 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 you, you are not allowed to use. <laughs> yeah, not allowed to use zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a, b, c are integers, n is greater than two, another integer grade strictly greater than two, then you have no solutions. That's Fermat's last theorem. That's not the theorem we are interested in. We're interested in Fermat's little theorem, and the theorem goes like this. For p prime, this is a super useful theorem, by the way. We will start right away with a math counts problem. Yes, this has two versions. Oops, sorry for that. Two different versions. The, the first version, I think, is, um, is the general version. It says for p prime, a to the power p is congruent to what? That's a p, believe it or not, modulo p. a to the power p is congruent to not one, it's a, right. So a to the power p is congruent to uh, a mod p. There's a second version which says for p prime and a and p relatively prime, then I think this is the one that most people know, right? a to the power p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. There you go. Okay, so I think that's the, 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 more, uh, the one that we are more... Uh, familiar with, right? The reason this, the second one takes care of the situation where A can be a multiple of P. So if you don't want to A to be a multiple of P like zero, uh, so this case handles zero, right? Zero even is satisfied by this. But the second version, he ignores zero or all the multiples of P. So therefore th this is also, yeah, so kind of useful. Do you know how to prove this? Why is this true? Why is it that I multiply a p minus one times, I get a one? Yes. All right, so yeah, there's a couple of people who know. If you check my YouTube channel, you will see a combinatorial proof of that using Burnside's lemma. 
but probably you won't like it. So that's the standard proof uses induction. Induction. But because we don't want induction on P, we do induction on A. So what that means is, um, uh, well, okay, so for instance, does this result work if A were one? Well, obviously, right? So because one to the power P minus one is obviously equal to one and it is congruent to one mod P. So that would definitely work, no doubt about that. So then you can assume, assume, so we are done with the base case. Assume that it works for, uh, for um, what do you call it? It works uh, for A. And then we will show that it also works for A plus one. So A to the power P minus A, I'm going to use the first version, okay? So this is the general version. I don't have to worry about A and P being relatively prime. So assume this is true and then show what? and show that P also divides A plus one, that's, that's induction, minus A plus one, oops, minus A plus one. And I think it's obvious that this first one, we can easily expand using binomial expansion, uh, something that you guys learned it in your algebra classes, I hope. Um, so let's quickly do it then. So all we do is check if that expression, so A plus one, raised to the p power, okay, let me just move it up, okay, uh, minus a plus one, let's see what this thing will be equal to, so that's equal to, well, I'm expanding this one first, a to the p plus, uh, p choose one, a to the p minus one, plus p choose two, a to the power p minus two, plus da da dot, plus p choose p minus one, a plus one, and we still have this monster over here, minus a minus one, hey, plus one, minus one, they cancel out. And besides, I can move that minus A over here next to, to this monster. Why would I do that? Because look at that, A to the P minus A, aha, that's nice. We already know this is, we assumed it is correct, right? Uh, and we, we have all these combinations left over. A to the P minus, oops, come on. P minus one plus P choose two, a to the p minus two, oops, a to the p minus two, da da da, and then finally p choose p minus one a. All right, so we already know the first one is divisible by p by the assumption. We need to now show that to, to in order to to finish the proof to show that this is divisible by p. The first component it is divisible by p. Why is the last part also divisible by p? Why are all these terms divisible by p? P is a prime, yes. Why does this prime divide this P choose one times A to the power something, P choose two times A to the power something? It's those combinations, right? Inside each of these combinations, yes, each of these coefficients has a P in it, believe it or not. We were kind of worried that if it was P choose P in the end, P choose P is not divisible by P. But all of these has a P in them, those combinations. And that's, that's pretty much it. So the first term is divisible by P. The second term, this huge term is divisible by P. As a result, this is divisible by P and we proved it using induction. So you guys learned how to prove Fermat's little theorem using induction. Now, are you ready for a math counts problem? If I remember it correctly, a few years ago in the math counts, there was this problem. It was a very neat problem. So the question says, what is two to the power 972 congruent to modulo 977. So that's our first problem today. Okay, good observations. A couple of you already mentioned that this is a prime. Wow, which is good. Prime gives me confidence. Well, because as soon as I see it's a prime and two is relatively prime to 977, obviously. Um, so we, we know that by Fermat's little theorem, okay, let's write that down. Fermat's little theorem tells us that two to the power 976 is congruent to one modulo 977. Ah, I wish it was two seven, 972, right? 976. So what should I multiply both sides of this congruence so that I can get a 272 on the left-hand side? Two raised to the power 972 on the left-hand side. 
I can multiply both sides of this congruence by, yes, <laughs> or divide by. <laughs> yeah, I need to divide both sides by 2 to the power 4, right? Uh, divide it by 16. But dividing it by 16 is the same thing as multiplying it by the inverse of 16. Okay, got it. So we multiply both sides by 2 to the power minus 4. So 2 to the power 976 is congruent to 2 to the power minus 4 times 1, which is just 2 to the power minus 4. Everything is in mod 977. I won't write it again. So therefore, hey, on the left-hand side, we have exactly what we need. 972. Ah, so 2 raised to the power 972 is actually just 2 to the power minus 4, which we can write it as 2 to the power 4 minus 1, which is, uh, uh, which is just the inverse of 16, modulo 977. Sometimes when we are lazy, we just drop the word modulo, just put it inside the parentheses. So how in the world can I find the inverse of 16? Should I just keep multiplying 16 over and over and over? I mean, that's annoying, right? Well, I think we are extremely lucky because if you check the multiples of 16, uh, there's one which is extremely close to 16 and that, uh, sorry, to 977, and that's 61. That's correct. So if you check it uh, using division algorithm, for instance, you can see that 977, uh, 977, if you were to divide it by 16, you would get 61 times 16 with a remainder of one, if I'm not mistaken. That, yeah, that should be 976. Yeah, there you go. What do I do at this step? I would Yeah, just take the mod 977 of both sides. Yes, let's take the mod of both sides, mod 977 of both sides. The left-hand side, that's just a zero, is congruent to 61 times 16 plus one. Aha. So uh, I can move that one to the left-hand side. That would be a minus one, is congruent to 61 times 16. But instead of writing it like this, I can further multiply it by minus one. So that would become a plus, that would become a minus. Aha! So modulo 977. Nice! So I have established that the inverse of 16 modulo 977 is minus 61. Well, obviously it's not customary to write a number in minus form. So 16, so we can continue here. Uh, so 16 inverse is just minus 61 which is congruent to, yes, you, you need to add 977 to it. So that's 916 indeed, modulo 977. That's pretty cool. So you, you can easily see an application where it works. So here another one. Okay, so I, this is a silly question that I just made up this morning, but okay, so bear with me. So how about this? So if I ask you, what is, uh, what is the remainder if I divide one, two, three, four times five, six, seven, eight, raised to the 10th power, plus, plus or minus, minus, sorry, five, six, seven, eight, times one, two, three, four, raised to the 10th power. If I were to divide it by 11, what would be the remainder? Question mark, modulo 11. One, two, three, four, times five, six, seven, eight, raised to the 10th power, minus five, six, seven, eight, times one, two, three, four, raised to the 10th power. <laughs> well, some of you guys are suggesting that we can just first of all look at one, two, three, four, modulo eleven. And then five, seven, six, eight, modulo eleven, and th then just reduce them to begin with. Oh, they are both two. I didn't notice that. Oh, okay. So pretend we didn't know that. Okay, I, I didn't know that was the case. Sorry for that. I didn't even check it. One thing you can easily do is we can factor out one, two, three, four, and five, seven, five, six, seven, eight. Right? One, two, three, four times five, six, seven, eight, and oh, wait. Wait, 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 I'm so sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
the, the order, yeah, the, the, I messed up. So this was 11, sorry, 11th power, not 10th power, sorry. Ah, oh, okay, I, 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 the, the, I killed the moment, I guess. Anyhow, so times, so if you factor out these two, so what's left inside the first term is five, six, seven, eight raised to the 10th power minus uh, one, two, three, four raised to the 10th power. And now we would wonder, yeah, it's still, yeah. Okay, so I claim this is just a zero. So that's my claim. Why is it a zero? Well, first of all, let's think. If any one of these are divisible by 11, that would mean that they would be congruent to zero, right? If any one of them were to be congruent to zero, then that whole product, we have a product of three numbers here, one, two, and then this whole thing, that's three numbers. Of course, it would have been a zero, right? Let's assume that's not the case. I won't even bother to, to calculate them. So let's assume that both of them were distinct from zero. And you guys already told me it's a two, but pretend I didn't know it. Pretend that this was such a huge number and this 11 was a big number too. So if one, two, three, four, four and five, six, seven, eight were both not zero mod 11, which means they were both relatively prime to 11, then what does that mean? What does that mean about this first term over here? If five, six, seven, eight, ah, yes, by Fermat's little theorem, a number which is not relatively prime to, uh, which is relatively prime, sorry, to 11, raised to the 11 minus first power, which is 10, that should be congruent to one by Fermat's little theorem, right? And the same thing here. We just mentioned that if one, two, three, four were, were congruent to zero mod 11, then this would have been a zero. We assumed that both of them not be congruent to zero. So if that's the case, then it's relatively prime to 11. That thing is also one by Fermat's little theorem. And of course, their difference would be zero. So either these things are zero and this one is not zero. It doesn't matter. The result would be zero. Or uh, these things are not zero mod 11, but the inside becomes zero anyways and boom. So it works regardless. All right. So pretty good. Um, if you guys want, okay, one more fun question and then uh, the, the main uh, topic for today. As usual, I'm just leaving the last 30 minutes for the more advanced stuff. Okay, so here's one more question. Uh, do you think that uh, if I were to divide a row of 12 ones, so this is a huge number, right? One, 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 two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. So we have 12 ones. If I were to divide it by 13, what would be the remainder? 12 ones. What is, <laughs> can't you just, aha, <laughs> uh -huh. something fishy. 12 ones and we are calculating it modulo 13. So you have repeated ones, repeated ones. Is there another way to write out those repeated ones? These rep units. So you have a bunch of ones. There's a very cool trick to write a bunch of ones repeated, like 11, for instance, or 111, 1111. Something really cool about writing them out. Especially, how can I get that 12 involved? Yes, we can write it as a sum of powers of 10, which is perfect. And then once you write it as a sum of powers of 10, you can apply the binomial theorem, reverse engineer, or you can directly observe the following. Instead of writing it as 12 ones, I can write it as 12 nines and divide it by nine, right? That's the same thing. Do you guys agree? But then 12 nines, how can I write 12 nines? 10 to the power something minus one. So 12 nines is, one followed by 12 zeros, which is 10 to the power 12, and then subtract a one from it. Holy, now let's, <laughs> now let's check the numerator. We totally don't care about the inverse of nine modulo 13, something you guys can check it later on, but 10 to the power 12. 10 is relatively prime to 13, and besides 12 is just one less than 13. By Fermat's little theorem, this is just, the numerator is congruent to zero, 
well, one minus one, let's say. And the denominator is nine, which is just multiplying by the inverse of nine, which I don't care because the numerator is already zero. That's just a zero. Wow, so that's pretty cool. Okay, let me give you a, a, maybe a homework type of thing. Um, or, um, okay, so I don't have time, so, uh, but okay, if you want, okay, just a homework. Uh, so can I do it at home, okay? So what is seven to, to the power eight congruent to modulo 240? Seven to the power, actually, let's quickly do it together, okay? So seven to the power eight modulo 240. So how do you do a problem like this? Ah. Some of you guys are using some technical words. Yes, so I think the main idea is to recognize that 240, uh, you can uh, have a prime factorization, which is two to the four uh, times, I think three and, uh, wait, what's it? Uh, hmm? Three and five, yes, thank you. Yeah, it's 15 times 16, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so someone is asking you that huge number to divide it by 240 and asking you what would be the remainder when you divide that huge number by 240. We might as well divide it by 16, by three and five, and then based on that, we can try to guess the answer. And if you guys already know the technical word for that, that's Chinese remainder theorem, that's correct. So CRT. But uh, that's not today's topic anyway, so that's why I won't bother about it. I will try to use my judgment to, 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 to find the correct answer, okay? So all I need is, therefore, let's do it. This one is kind of annoying. I don't know how to handle it for now, but these two should be very straightforward. So seven to the power eight is congruent to question mark modulo three. Yes, seven, well, okay, so here is a very important uh, uh, trick, if you will. You are allowed to rewrite this, the, the, the base in mod three, but you are not allowed to touch the, the, the exponent. That's a big uh, violation, right? That's, that's horrible, that's the worst thing you can do. But you can easily, easily handle the, uh, the, the base. So you can write it as one, right? Because seven is congruent to three mod. Uh, one mod three, right? So one to the eight, that's just a one. What was another way to figure that? that that's, that's an easy way to see. There was another way to see it. What is the, an alternative way to see? Yes, okay, so some of you guys already suggested, yes. So you just realize that three is prime. We can just use Fermat's little theorem. Fermat's little theorem says that any number well, in this case, seven is relatively prime to three. So seven squared, seven to the power three minus one. So seven squared is definitely one mod three. And as a result, I can take both sides, the fourth power of both sides and boom. That's an alternative way to recognize that that's also a one. Do you guys see that? That's pretty cool, huh? We can do the same trick for two to the four. Yes, we will do the same trick for two to the four as well. Okay, let's quickly do uh, seven to the eight um, modulo five. Actually, let's use Fermat's little theorem so that we, we kind of gain experience. Otherwise, we can just do two to the power eight, right? So let's, let's not do it that way. So by Fermat's little theorem, we know that seven to the power something is congruent to one. What is that something? By Fermat's little theorem, Yes, five minus one, that's a four, right? Fermat's little theorem says if the modul modulo is a prime, then raising that number to one less than that, that's one, yes. So therefore, hey, I can square both sides. And boom, so that's a one as well, good. So, so far seven to the power eight, I know modulo three, it's a one, modulo five, it's a one. Now all I care is seven to the eight modulo 16. Seven to the eight is congruent to question mark modulo 16. And if you are wondering what is 16, 16 is two to the power four. What is seven to the eight modulo 16? All right, so you guys already uh, have a very, some very good uh, ideas on how to deal with this. You guys can use binomial theorem, a lot of other stuff. There's a generalization of Fermat's little theorem, yes, which we call it as Euler's. 
theorem. So Euler's theorem is a generalization because it works for any number. So this modulo not a prime, right? Not prime. Because it's not a prime, we cannot use Fermat's little theorem, but it doesn't mean there's nothing. Yeah, there is an idea called Euler's theorem, Euler theorem. It is, you can do it for any, uh, for any mod basically. Uh, and, and the theorem is very simple. If A and M are relatively prime, then uh, a raised to the power phi of m is congruent to one mod m. Holy, what is that? A raised to the power phi of m. In this example, that would mean that 7 raised to the power phi of 16 is congruent to 1. So I need to make use of this to calculate that. So, but first I need to understand what is that phi function. So what is phi of a number? Phi of a number counts the number of numbers <laughs> less than or equal to n that are relatively prime, relatively prime to n. All right, let's just do a couple of examples quickly. So for instance, what is, this is extremely important for the next thing I'm going to show. So phi of, uh, say for instance, five. What are the numbers less than five relatively prime to five? Yes, uh, that's a four y because one, two, three, and four, they are all relatively prime to five, boom. So what is phi of, say, eight? How many numbers are relatively prime to eight? Yes, they would be the odd numbers, right? One, two, one, three, five, seven, they are all relatively prime, so there's four as well. How about phi of a hundred? How many numbers are relatively prime to a hundred? So in order to answer these type of questions, there's basically two rules and the rules are extremely simple. They, uh, let me show you the first rule, okay? The first rule says this, phi of, let's say, uh, five cubed. How many numbers are relatively prime to 125? Well, how many numbers are... Yes. Okay. So the, the, the cool idea is if you write out all the divisors of five cubed, so one, five, all the multiples of five will be there, right? So therefore, five cubed has 125 numbers less than or equal to 125. And of those numbers, 25 of them, so... Uh, are, uh, are, are not relatively prime, so the answer is 100. It turns out there's a very cool trick. The trick is the following. If you have a prime raised to the nth power, that's simply equal to p to the n minus uh, p to the n minus one. All right, so that's the first thing you need to know. And the second thing is the following. Phi of a times b, if a and b are relatively prime, is equal to phi of a times phi of b. So uh, knowing this, when a and b are relatively prime, you can calculate anything, just these two properties. You can calculate the, um, um, the phi of any number. And why do I need the phi of a number? Because the exponent thing, right? All right, so um, why do I say I can calculate anything? Because for any number, I can do the prime factorization. So this is just two square times five square. And the second rule tells me that I can split it phi of two square times phi of five square. And the, la the first rule tells me how to handle the, 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 the powers of uh, prime. So that's just the first one is just two square times two to the one. The second one is five square times five to the one and boom, two square, four minus two, that's a two. Five square, 25 minus five, that's a 20, that's a 40. Okay, so phi of 100. So going back here, phi of 16, how many numbers less than or equal to 16 are relatively prime to 16? You can list them out, right? Well, the good news is only odd numbers, right? Because 16 is two to the power of four. We didn't even have to do any of it. But if you apply the rule that I just mentioned, so that would be five of two to the power of four is just equal to two to the power of four minus two cubed. That's, that's a cubed. 16 minus eight, that's an eight. All right. So wow, you guys are really, really good. Okay, so a lot of people are answering at the same time, which is really perfect. All right, so now what, we, what I know is directly seven to the eight is actually one by Euler's theorem, that's it. So therefore, you need to tell me that, well, seven to the eight 
it has a remainder of one when divided by three. It has a remainder of one when divided by five. It has a remainder of one when divided by 16. So therefore the number has to have a remainder of one when divided by 240 as well. All right, but this idea of Euler's uh, theorem, but more important than Euler, this concept is an amazing concept, phi of n. It will kind of nicely help us organize uh, the way we do things. All right, L uh, lastly, so this, this thing, this concept that I left it to the very last, uh, so we have about 21, 22 minutes. So the idea of, remember how, um, uh, for instance, you can use Euler's theorem or Fermat's little theorem to find, uh, for instance, if I ask you, um, two to the power, say, modulo 11, let's say, in modulo 11, we know that two to the power 10 is congruent to one modulo 11, right? Um, oh, hold on, yes. Um, so one wonders if this is the smallest one, right? Do you think there's a smaller power of two that can hit one before 10? So that's kind of the idea that we will be talking about in the rest of the class, which is a pretty good idea. It will take us to some really advanced stuff, so which is pretty good for those of you who are interested in that stuff. Uh, so the question is, uh, so the question, what is the smallest power uh, uh, that will make our number that makes the number congruent to one, right? The smallest power of n, that makes n to the power that number, p, or well, not p. <laughs> uh, we call it the order of it, actually. The order of it, congruent to one modulo, any modulo, basically. That's our goal, to understand what exponent will make it one. Obviously, two to the 10 is one because of uh, by Fermat's little theorem, but we want to expand this idea. Okay, why don't we just write out all the powers of two? Let me give you a few minutes to write out all the powers of two. So two to the power, maybe we can start with zero, right? Two to the power one, two squared, and so on. Two cubed, two to the four, two to the five, oh, well, uh, modulo 11, yeah. So all the powers of two modulo 11, yes. Two to the six, two to the seven, two to the eight, 2 to the 9, 2 to the 10, and we will see 2 to the 11, 2 to the 12. I don't know, we can keep going on and on if we want to. Yeah, 2 to the 0, yeah, no doubt. 2 to the 1, that's a 2, that's a 4. Remember, we are doing it modulo 11, that's an 8. 2 to the 4, that would be 16, that's a 5. 2 to the 5 is a 32, so um, 22, so that's a, a 10, is it? All right. Oh, wow, you guys already write it. Thank you. Nine, seven. Okay, so uh, I'm just following <laughs> the chat box. So you, we have a nine, a seven, two to the eight, that's a three, two to the nine, that's a six, I think you guys are saying. Uh, let me know if I do any mistake. Two to the 10 is, well, we already know two to the 10 is a one, right? Two to the 11, how about two to the 11? Is there an easy way to do all these parts? For instance, when you how did you guys figure that two to the seven is a seven? Did you do two to the seven is 128 and then you, you divided it by 11? Is that how you did it? You divided 128 by 11 and then you divided 256 by 11? Uh, there's, a, there's an easier way, right? Yeah, the easier way is two to the seven is just two times two to the six, right? So you might as well just, whatever is the previous number, just multiply it by two and then take it mod 11, right? Right, right, that's pretty good. So for instance, once you have eight here, eight times two is 16. So that gives you a, re a remainder of five. Five times two is 10, so good. 10 times two, 20, modulo 11, that's a remainder of nine. Nine times two is 18. Do you guys see? Because two to the seven is just two to the six times two to the one, which is not. So seven uh, times two is uh, 14. So that gives you a three because I'm uh, modulo 11 and so on. So what will happen after this? After we hit the one, Again, multiplying by two, hey, the sequence will repeat afterwards, right? So I don't have to do anything after two to the power 10. That's, that's pretty much it. So indeed we were correct. So we can now write the notation. The order of two modulo 11 is indeed a 10. 
Okay, that's a, the first observation that I figured, meaning the smallest, the smallest uh, power that you need to make it equal to one is actually 10. What else did you see from, uh, from all these calculations? There's a quite a, oh, sorry, I don't need this one. So there's a quite a few interesting things that came out of it. At least another one, which is very important. What came out of this thing here? When you take the powers. Yes, it repeats after two to the 10, yes. Ah, so there's a couple of people who saw what's going on. Yes. Yes, we covered the whole complete residue class. Yes, 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 that's, that's it. We get everything basically. So that's when I say everything, everything, yes, everything, everything. Look, uh, we have, well, except zero. <laughs> One, two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Of course, the question that I will ask is, was it a coincidence? Was, how do you spell was? Was this a coincidence? Was this a coincidence? And you would say, yes. <laughs> no, sir. It was a providence, yes. All right, so there is something deep going on here, right? So let's see if we can exploit a little bit of that. But okay, so so far we did it for two. Do you think we can do it for three? Let's quickly do it. Okay, the powers of three, are we out of our mind? Okay, modulo 11, modulo 11 again. I want to check all the powers of three. So you guys start over there, I do it over here. Let's see if we can find something nice out of this whole thing. By the way, in your spare time, that's what you should be doing, right? Not playing all these video games that you guys are already sick playing. So discovering some new patterns for yourself. Wait a second, I don't have to go after three to the power 10, right? I already know by Fermat's little theorem that three to the 10 is definitely congruent to one and afterwards it will repeat, right? So whatever that thing is, three to the 12, so is the same as three squared, which is a nine. So that will repeat afterwards. I won't bother writing three to the 13 and so on. So anything after that is totally not, so repeats, repeat. But I would be very, so three, nine, wait, three, five, nine, four, one. Okay, three, five, what? Three, five, nine, wait, I got nine already. Three cube is 27, which is a five. Oh yeah, five, four, one, three, four, one, three. Okay, keep it on the screen. Nine five four one nine five four one. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. So what happened here? Hmm. The situation here is different than the situation that we got previously, right? Yes. The, Fermat's little theorem tells us that three to the ten is congruent to one, but that's not necessarily the smallest one that will hit a one. The order of 3 modulo 11, what is it equal to? The smallest one is a 5, yes. And it repeats after the 5, right, right, right. Do you guys see that? So the order of 3 modulo 11 is a 5. Last year and the year before, on if you check the Amy uh, on my YouTube channel, uh, you can see the solutions of the hardest Amy prompts. Like, I think it was number 14 last year. That was the concept that uh, it was about order. If you know order, like how to exponentiate. Uh, obviously, the, the, or, the, the, the powers were very big, but so that was the idea. Hey, this situation here is different than what happened previously. Why don't we like the, the, the way that we are like so geeky, right? So we love math and everything. Why don't we just make a table? A here, and then the order of A modulo 11 for all the numbers. Dr. Null, are we out of our mind? Why would we do that? To discover something which is interesting, right? I need one more, 10. There you go. So what is the order of these things? So what is the order of one? What is the smallest power of one which will make it congruent to one? What is the smallest power of one which makes one to the power? Yeah, zero, ignore zero. Yeah, yeah, ignore zero. <laughs> yeah, one to the one. We would say that the order of one is one. All right? Yeah, ignore zero. I think we should. 
All right. How about 2? What is the smallest power of 2 which will make it congruent to 1? 2 to the which power is... We just did it, right? So that's just a 10. And how about... What was the smallest power of 3 which makes it congruent to 1? That was a 5. We just did it a minute ago. How about 4? I, I think you guys are amazing already. So... If you did four, what would be the four to the power, which power, the smallest one, would make it congruent to one mod 11? Well, obviously we know 10 works, but is there something which is smaller than 10 which makes it congruent to one? And it kind of is, right? So because two to the 10 is, if two to the 10 is one, two to the 10 can be written as two squared to the five, which is the four to the five must be one as well. So at least it's a five, and when you check it, there's no other smaller power of four, which can be congruent to one, so you, you establish five here. If you do it, how about for five? What is the smallest power of five, which will make it congruent to one? Five to the which power makes it congruent to one? Is it 10? Do I need to wait all the way up to 10, or is that an earlier? So you guys can quickly calculate those. Yes, it turns out this is also a five. For six, Okay, let me finish this table if you guys want, because we are running out of time. That's a 10. For 7, interestingly, that's a 10. You can't reach to uh, 1 before that. That's a 10. This is a 5, and that's a 2. All right, so now I'm opening the floor. Let's discuss these numbers. What type of orders do you see here? What are some interesting stuff? So many 10s and 5s, that's correct. We are, remember that we are checking order modulo 11, right? Order modulo 11. Hmm. Nice. So these are, yeah. These are all divisors of 10. Divisors of 10. And for a good reason, I think, right? If when you raise a number like a here to a power, let's say n, and if you are expecting it to be congruent to one mod m, because I already know that a to the power phi of m, well, in this case, it's, okay, let, let's just do it for 11, hold on. Let's just do it for 11. Because I know that a to the power 10 is already congruent to one, if that n, anything works, it better be one of the divisors of 10, which is p minus 1 here, right? Because how can it be that a to the power something else might work, right? So we are suggesting that if that n is anything, it has to be one of those divisors of 10 for a good reason. For instance, a to the power, I don't know, let's say square. If a square is 1, it wouldn't violate the Euler, right? I can take the fifth power of both sides and it's still one. So, so as a result, Euler theorem is valid. But you will never get a situation where a cubed will be one, right? Because this is Euler, right? So this one was Euler. So if a cubed was, if there exists such an a, which hopefully we didn't find any, where this is one, then how can it be? Because if I take the cube of both sides, that will still be one. And further, I can multiply both sides by a, so the, the only way, so that would be a to the power 10. So we are saying a to the power 10 is congruent to a, which is not correct. It was supposed to be one unless a is congruent to one. Yes. Do you guys see that? So it, we are not surprised to see that these are all divisors of 10. What else? These are all divisors of 10. Interesting. Okay. So uh, yeah, like I said, because we are running out of time, I will just check the ones which have, which have an order of 10. 2 has an order of 10. What else? Um, 6 has an order of 10. 7 has an order of 10. 8 has an order of 10. Th there's a special name for these monsters here. We call them primitive roots. Primitive roots. Modulo 11, obviously. Modulo 11. And what is so cool about these roots? So, for instance, when, when I took all the powers of 2, it hit everybody, right? It hit the whole complete residue class. The same thing will happen here and here and here. Did you know that? That's a really cool thing. All right, so just uh, to, to give you an idea, 
about that. Let's try uh, something new, for instance. Um, uh, so that, uh, um, and again, let's try something small. Um, let's say, for instance, modulo 19. All right. So I'll take you, let's do it one more time so we, we really know what we are doing. So we are kind of uh, practicing our uh, skills. Um, so I'll go ahead and take all the powers of 2 modulo 19. Let's do it. So obviously I can start with 2 to the power 0 if you want. So um, 2 to the power 0, that's a 1. 2 to the power 1, that's a 2. 2 to the power 2, that's a 4. 2 to the power 3, that's an 8. 2 to the power 4. That's a uh, 16, thank you. That one is a 16. Two to the power five is, uh, I think it's, um, well, I can just multiply the previous number by two, which is 32, and a modulo 19, that would be 13, right? Just multiply the previous by two and then subtract 19 from it, if it's, uh, so two to the power six is uh, seven. Two to the power seven is uh, 14. 2 to the power 8 is uh, 2 times 14, 28. I think that's a 9. Uh, 2 to the power 9 is, oh gosh, a long way to go. Huh? Uh, 2 to the power 9 is um, 2 times 9, 18. Uh, oh, that's a minus 1, which is 18. Okay, that's good. 2 to the power 10 is, well, 2 times 18 or two times minus one minus two that's a 17 right so that's easy to calculate two to the power 11 is uh 15 uh, minus two times two is minus four two to the power 12 is 11 two to the power 13 is uh two times 11 22 that's a three uh two to the power 14 oops that's a two here all right so two to the power 14 is a six 2 to the power 15, almost there, that's a 12. 2 to the power 16, that's a 5. 2 to the power 17 is a 10. Oops, that's a 10, sorry. And 2 to the power 18, uh, well, 2 to the power 18 and 2 to the power 0 are the same thing. Because of Fermat's little theorem, I already know that's a 1. All right, so I listed all of them. That's pretty cool. Uh, so now tell me what's going on. So one thing you guys probably realize, I, I did something here. What did I do when I wrote out all the numbers? <laughs> yeah, I tried to be uh, creative here. I, I wrote them in a special way. How did I write all these powers? So, well, first of all, it's clear that um, the order of 2 modulo 19 is, is also 18, right? So, yes, I wrote it in a cycle just so that because we know that it repeats after 2 to the 18. Yeah, that makes sense. So, we observed a couple of things. We observed that 2 to the 18 is congruent to 1, and that's it. 18 is the smallest. So, therefore, the order of 2 modulo 19 is 18. The largest it can be, right? It can't be more than 18, right? So that's pretty good. But now my question to you is the following. I wonder what is the order of, uh, let's say, order of 17 mod 19? What is this one congruent to? How can I find which power of 17 will hit a 1? Which power of 17 can hit a 1? So what I mean is the smallest power of 17. Obviously, 17 to the 18 is 1 for sure, but I'm looking for the smallest one. All right, so you guys are already suggesting yes. So the key idea here is the following. I'm looking for a power of 17 and to make it a 1, right? Oh, actually, let, let's make it down here. Okay, so we are in mod 19. Okay, let, let, let me ask that question over here. Um, Okay, so we have 2 to the power, oh, sorry, 17 to the power d is congruent to 1. And we want the smallest and d smallest. Wait a second, you are probably telling me that, hey, because 2 uh, has order 18, it is a primitive root, 
it hits everything, right? It hits all the numbers here, and it will certainly hit 17 as well. I can rewrite 17 as a power of two instead. Do you guys agree? So as a power of two, 17 is just, so two to the 17, sorry, 17 to the power D is the same thing as two to the power, wait, wait, where is 17? Uh, where are you? Oh, here, two to the power 10. Do you guys agree? So two to the power 10 to the power D, which is just, yes, two to the power 10 D. Now we want two to the power 10 D to be one mod 19. So what can you say about 10 D? The only way this would be congruent to one if it was that 10 D is a multiple of 18, right? Why? Because by, by Euler's theorem, we already know, huh? so let me just make it slightly smaller here. By Euler, we already know that two to the power 18 is congruent to one, or Fermat, you can say. By Fermat, we already know. So the only way 10D is, will make it two to the power 10D will be one is if 10D was congruent to zero, if it was a multiple of 18. Now that's interesting. That's very, very interesting. And, and it's clear, right? Because if 10D is a multiple of 18, uh, okay, if you want, let me write it like this. If 10D is something like 18T, for instance, so then that would become two to the power 10D, so two to the power 18T. And I can write it as two to the power 18 raised to the power T. Two to the power 18 is just a one, so one to the T would be a one. So what, what is the smallest D that satisfies this? I can simplify by two. So the smallest D here will be, and so, okay, let me do it in two steps. Yes, 5D is equal to 9T. The smallest D would be a nine, yes. So therefore the order here of 17 is a nine. The big picture is more important. So we learned actually the big picture here. The big picture is whenever you know one of the primitive roots, in, in this case, we established that two is a primitive root, then suddenly you can easily find the order of all the other numbers pretty quickly, like 17 or five or 13. What is the order of 13, for instance? All you do is you write rewrite 13 as a, uh, uh, as a power of, two, if you guys want, let's do it one more time, right? So just to make sure everybody agrees and then we will call it a day, right? Um, yeah, so um, for instance, what is the order, oops, what's the order of 13 uh, modulo 19, question mark? So all I need is 13 raised to the power D, one mod 19, and suddenly I realize 13 can be written as two to the power five. So two to the power five D, is congruent to one modulo 19. Wait a second, all I need is 5D to be a multiple of 18 again, right? Because of the Euler thing. So if we want 5D to be congruent to zero mod 18. Oh, so what's happening here is the following then. An exponent mod 19, we are turning it into a multiplication mod 18, that's it. That's really what's going on. So which, is my, which one is easier to handle, an exponentiation or a multiplication? Of course multiplication. And obviously here D is, D is what? The smallest, that's 18, right? Because five and 18 are relatively prime. So the, the order of that is 18. Wait a second. Uh, that also gives me this amazing idea. What are all the primitive roots? It, it that tells you that 13 is actually a primitive root, right? Because this thing came out as an 18. Well, obviously it, it, the answer is any, the orders are all multiple uh, divisors of 18. So how can we now establish all the primitive roots? So, so far we know that two is a primitive root. Now we learned that two to the five is a primitive root. What are the other primitive roots? What is the pattern here? So all the numbers which are relatively prime to what number? Because eventually this exponentiation will reduce into this thing, modulo 18, and all I will check is the, uh, huh? yes, the powers of two which are relatively prime to 18, right? 
So what are the numbers which are relatively prime to 18? You just check those and you just highlight them. So the numbers which are relatively prime to 18 is the same thing as relatively prime to two and three at the same time. So the numbers which are relatively two and three at the same time, so two to the power uh, seven works, two to the power 11 works, right? So because 11 is relatively prime to two and three, two to the power 13 works. Is there any else? And then two to the power, oh yeah, 17 also works. That's it. So the, the, the primitive roots modulo 19 as a result are the following numbers. They are two, 13, 14, 15, three, and 10. Now what you can do is I can give you guys one more homework and then let's call it a day. Now uh, it's quite natural in general from here to jump to an idea called quadratic residues. Quadratic residues is which numbers can you hit by squaring? So why don't you guys try testing squaring numbers? So uh, as a homework, like just for fun. So for instance, in modulo 19, check all the squares, the number squares only, not all the powers of a single number. What I'm saying is check two square, well, one square, two square, three square, four square, and see which numbers you can hit modulo 19. And then see if you can come up with a similar pattern that we created over here, right? So that would be kind of fun. All right, okay, so we are already over time, so let me uh, stop.